been following my newsletter, you probably saw what I had in the signature line the last few weeks, how to make a fake identity. Well, we're going to take it a little bit differently today and talk about how to stop spam with a fake email. Email is something that we've had for a long time. I think I've told you before, I had email way back in the uh, early 80s, late 70s, actually. So, yeah, it's been a while. And I get tens of thousands of email every day uh, sent to my domain, you know, mainstream.net. That's my company. I've had that same domain name for 30 years. And and it just kind of got out of control. And so we have a big Cisco server that exclusively filters email for us and our clients. And so it cuts down the tens of thousands to... A very manageable couple of hundred a day, if you think that's manageable, and it gets rid of almost all of the phishing and a lot of the spam and other things that are coming in. But, you know, there's an easier way to do this, maybe not quite as effective, but allowing you to track this whole email problem and the spam. I'm going over this in some detail in my upcoming boot camp, so make sure you keep an eye on your email so you know about this thing. Again, it's free, right? I do a lot of the stuff just to help you guys understand it. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, just beat you into submission to buy something. This is a boot camp. My workshops, my boot camps, my emails, they are all about informing you. I try to make them the most valuable piece of email you get during the week. So we're going to go into this in some detail in this upcoming boot camp. But what we're looking at now is a number of different vendors that have gotten together in order to help prevent some of the spam that you might have been getting. Now, I think that's a very cool idea to have these these sometimes temporary, sometimes fake email addresses that you can use. There's a company out there called Fastmail. You might want to check them out. There's another company called Apple. <laughs> And you might might want to check them out. I'll be talking about their solution here as well. But the idea is, why not just have one email address? And if you're an Apple user, even if you don't have the hardware, you can sign up for an Apple account. And then once you have that account, you can use a new feature. I saw it, uh, in, in fact, in Firefox, if you use Firefox at all. When there's a form and it asks for an email address, Firefox volunteers to help you make a fake-ish email address. Now, I say fake-ish because it's a real email address that forwards to your normal regular address email address. And as part of the boot camp, I'm also going to be explaining the eight email addresses, minimum eight that you have to have, what they are, how to get them, how to use them. But for now, you can just go online to Google. This will get you started and do a search for Apple's new hide my email feature. This lets you create random email addresses and those email addresses end up in your regular uh, iCloud.com or me.com, whatever you might have for your email address address that Apple has set up for you. Isn't that cool? And you can do that by going into your iCloud settings, and it's part of their service they're offering for this iCloud Plus thing. And they've got three different fi- privacy-focused services right now. So in order to get this from Apple, so you can create these unlimited number of rather random looking emails, for instance, uh, blue 126 underscore cat at iCloud.com. That doesn't tell anybody who you are. And you can put a label in there. What's the name of the website that, that or the, the uh, URL of the website that you created this email for, and then a note so that you can look at it later on to try and remember. And that way, this site that you just created it for. In this case, this is an article from CNET. They had an account at jamwirebeats.com. This is a weekly music magazine subscription that they had set up. And Apple generated this fake email address, blue126 underscore cat at iCloud.com. Now, I can hear you right now. 
<laughs> why would you bother doing that? It sounds like a lot of work. Well, first of all, it's not a whole lot of work, but the main reason to do that is if you get an email addressed to bluecat126 at icloud.com and it's supposedly from Bank of America, you instantly know that is spam. That is a phishing email because it's not using the email address you gave to TD Bank, is it? No, it's using the email address that was created for one website, jamwirebeats.com. This is an important feature, and that's what I've been doing for decades. Email allows you to have a plus sign in the email address, and Microsoft even supports it now. You have to turn it on. So I will use, for instance, Craig Plus uh, Libsyn as an example at craigpeterson.com. And now emails that uh, Libsyn wants to send me will go to Craig Plus Libsyn at craigpeterson.com, right? So the, the trick here is now if I get an email from someone other than Libsyn, I know wait a minute, this isn't Libsyn, and that now flags it as a phishing attack, right? Or at the very least, as some form of spam. So you got to keep an eye out for that. Uh, so you got to have iCloud Plus, and if you pay for the premium upgrade, which ranges from a dollar to ten dollars, uh, you, you've got it, okay? If, if you already have an iCloud account, your account automatically gets upgraded to iCloud Plus as part of iOS 15 that just came out, all right? So that's one way you can do it. If you're not an Apple fan, I already mentioned that Firefox, which is a browser, has a similar feature now. Firefox has just been crazy about trying to protect your privacy good for them frankly right so they've been doing a whole lot of stuff to protect your privacy however they or they have a couple of features that get around some of the corporate security and good corporate security people have those features blocked because it makes it impossible for them to monitor bad guys that might hack your account so that's another thing you can look at is firefox have a look at fastmail.com. And as I said, we're going to go into this in some detail in the boot camp. But fastmail lets you have these multiple email accounts. Now, they restrict it. It's not like Apple where it's an infinite number. But depending on how much you pay, fastmail is going to help you out there. And then if you're interested, by the way, just send an email to me, me, M-E at craigpeterson.com. Please use that email address, M-E at craigpeterson.com, because that one is the one that's monitored most closely. And just ask for my report on email. And I've got a bunch of them uh, that I'll be glad to send you that gets into some detail here. But Proton Mail is a mail service that's located in Switzerland. Now, I know of, in fact, a couple of uh, high-ranking military people. I mean, really high-ranking military people that are supposedly using Proton Mail. I have a Proton Mail account. I don't use it that much because I have so much else going on. But the advantage with Proton Mail is it is in Switzerland, and as a general rule, they do not let people know what your identity is so it's kind of untraceable hence these people high up in the department of defense right that are using proton mail however it is not completely untraceable there is a court case that uh, proton mail i don't know if you'd say they lost but proton mail was ordered about a month ago to start logging access and provide it for certain accounts. So they can do it, they are doing it, they don't use it in most cases, but ProtonMail is quite good. They have a little free level, they have paid levels, and you can do all kinds of cool stuff with ProtonMail. And many of you guys have already switched, uh, particularly people who asked for my special report on email, because I go into some reasons why you want to use different things. Now, there's one more I want to bring up, and that is TempMail. It's temp-mail.org. Don't send anything 
that is confidential on this. Don't include any credit card numbers, nothing, okay? But temp-mail.org will generate a temporary email address. Part of the problem with this, these temporary email addresses is they are blocked at some sites that really, really, really want to know what your real email address is, okay? But it's quite cool. It's quite simple. So I'm right there right now, temp-mail.org. And I said, okay, give me your email address. So give me one. It's a Pekabex 504 at datacop.com. It's this temporary email. And so you can copy that address. Then you can come back into, again, temp-mail.org and read your email for a certain period of time. So it is free. It's disposable email. Uh, it's not particularly private. They have some other things, but I wouldn't use them because I don't know them for some of these other features and services. So again, stop pesky email. Stop some of the successful phishing attempts by having a unique, not just password, but a unique email for all those accounts. And as I mentioned, upcoming boot camp, and I'll announce it in my weekly email. We're going to cover this in some detail. CraigPeterson.com. Make sure you would subscribe to my newsletter. Well, you've all heard ransomware is up, so what does that mean? Well, okay, it's up 33% since uh, the last two years, really, but what does that amount to? We're going to talk about that, and what do you do after you've been ransomed? Ransomware is terrible. It's crazy. Much of it comes in via email, these malicious emails. They are up 600% due to COVID-19. 37% of organizations were affected by ransomware attacks in the last year. That's according to Sophos. 37%, more than a third. Isn't that something? In 2021, the largest ransomware payout, according to Business Insider, was made by an insurance company at $40 million, setting a world record. The average ransom fee requested increased from $5,000 in 2018 to around $200,000 in 2020. Isn't that something? So in the course of three years, it went from $5,000 to 200,000. That's according to the National Security Institute. Experts estimate that a ransomware attack will occur every 11 seconds for the rest of the year. Uh, it, it's just crazy. Absolutely crazy, all of these stats. So what does it mean? Or, you know, okay, it's up this much, it's up that much. Okay, businesses are paying millions of dollars to get their data back. How about you as an individual? Well, as an individual right now, the average ransom is $11,605. So are you willing to pay more than $11,000 to get your pictures back off of your home computer in order to get your work documents, whatever you have on your home computer? Hopefully you don't have any work information on your home computer. Over $11,000. Uh, now, by the way, most of the time, these ransoms are actually an affiliate affair. In other words, there is a company that is doing the ransom work, and they are paying an affiliate who are the, the affiliate, in this case, are the people who infected you. And the affiliates are making up to 80% from all of these ransomware payments. It's crazy, right? So you can see why it's up. You can just go ahead and try and fool somebody into clicking on a link. Maybe it's a friend of yours you don't particularly like, some friend, right? And you can go ahead and send them an email with a link in it, and they click the link, and uh, it installs ransomware. And you get 80% of the money. Well, it is happening. It's happening a lot. So what do you do? This is a great little article over on Dark Reading. And you'll see it on the website the, at craigpeterson.com. 
But this article goes through what are some of the steps. It's by Daniel Clayton. It's actually quite a good little article. He's the VP of Global Security Services and support over at Bitdefender. Bitdefender is some great uh, software. It, it, you've got versions of it for the Mac. You've got versions for of it for Windows. You might want to check it out. But he's got a nice little list here of things that you want to do. So number one, don't panic, right? Scott Adams, don't panic. So we're worried because we think we're going to lose our job. Do you, do you know what, by the way, is in the top drawer of the majority of chief information security officers? Two things. Uh, one is their resignation letter, and the second one is their resume. Because if they are attacked, and it's very common, and if they get in trouble, they are leaving. And that's pretty common, too. Although I have heard of some companies that understand, hey, listen, you can't be 100% effective. You've got to prioritize your money and place your bets. It really is kind of like going to Vegas and betting on red or black right 50 50 chance now if you're a higher level organization like our customers that have to meet these highest compliance standards these federal government regulations uh, and some of the european regulations even state regulations well then we've got to keep you better than 99 percent safe and knock on wood over the course of 30 years that's how long i've been doing this 30 years we have never had a single customer get a, uh, a, a any type of malware, whether it is ransomware or anything else, including one custom company that's a multinational. We were taking care of one of their divisions, and the whole company got infected with ransomware. They had to shut down globally for over two weeks while they tried to recover everything. Our little corner of the woods the offices that we were protecting for that division, however, didn't get hit at all. So it is possible, right? I, I don't want you guys to think, man, there is nothing I can do, so I'm not going to do anything. One of the ladies in one of my mastermind groups basically said that, right? Because I was explaining uh, another member of my mastermind group got hit. Uh, got hit for, th I think it turned out to be $35,000. And, you know, that's a, a, a bad thing. Plus, you feel just so exposed. I've been robbed before. Uh, and it, it's just a terrible, terrible feeling. So he was just kind of freaking out for good reason. But I, I explained, okay, so here's what you do. And she walked away from it thinking, well, there's nothing I can do. Well, there are things you can do. It is not terribly difficult. And listening here, getting my newsletter, going to my boot camps and the workshops, which are more involved, you can do it, okay? It can be done. So I don't want you to panic. I don't want you to uh, think that there's zero you can do. So that's number one. If you do get ransomware, number two, you got to figure out where did this come from? What happened? I, I would change this order. So I would say don't panic. And then number two is turn off the system that got ransomware. Turn it off. One or more systems that might have gotten ransomware. And remember that the ransomware notification does not come up right when it starts encrypting your data. It doesn't come up once they've stolen your data. It comes up after they have spread through your organization. So smart money would say shut off every computer, every computer, not just pull the plug. I, I'm talking about the Ethernet cable, right? Don't just disconnect from Wi-Fi. Turn it off immediately. Shut it off. And pull the plug. It might be okay in some cases. The next thing that has to happen is each one of those machines needs to have its disk drive probably removed and examined to see if it has any of that ransomware on it. And if it does have the ransomware, it needs to get cleaned up or replaced. And in most cases, we recommend, hey, good time replace all the machines upgrade everything okay so that's the bottom line there so that's my, my number two okay um 
He has isolate and save, which makes sense. You're trying to minimize the blast radius. So he wants you to isolate them. I want you to turn them off because you do not want any ransomware that's on a machine in the process of encrypting your files. You don't want it to keep continue encrypting, okay? So hopefully you've done the right thing. You were following my 321 backup schedule that I taught last year to for free for anybody that attended. Hopefully you've already figured out if you're going to pay or not pay. I got to say some big companies have driven up the price of Bitcoin because they've been buying it as kind of a hedge against getting ransomware so they can just pay it right away. But you got to figure that out. There's no one size fits all for all of this. And at over $11,000 for an individual ransom, uh, this requires some preparation and some thought. Stick around, got a lot more coming up. Visit me online, craigpeterson.com, and get my newsletter along with all of the free trainings. Well, the bad guys have done it again. There is yet another way that they are sneaking in some of this ransomware, and it has to do with QR codes. This is actually kind of clever. By now, you must have seen, if not used, QR codes. These are these codes that are generally in a square and the shape of a square. And inside, there's these various lines. And in a QR code, you can encode almost anything. Usually what it is, is a URL. So it's just like typing in a web address into your phone, into your web browser, whatever you might be using. And they have been very, very handy. I've used them. I've noticed them even showing up now on television ads down in the corner. You can just scan the QR code in order to apply right away to get your Jinsu knives. Actually, I haven't seen it on that commercial, but uh, it's a, a different world. And we talked last week about some of these stores that are putting QR codes in their windows so people who are walking by, even when the store is closed, can order stuff, can get stuff. It's really rather cool, very nice technology. Uh, So anyways, there is a new technique to get past the email filters. You know, I provide email filters, these big boxes, I mean huge machines running Cisco software that are tied into uh, literally billion endpoints plus monitoring tens of hundreds of millions of emails a day. It's just huge. I don't even, I can, can't get my head around some of those numbers. But it's looking at all those emails. It is cleaning them up. It's looking at every URL that's embedded in an email says, well, is this a bad guy? It'll even go out and check the URL. It will look at the domain, say, how long has this domain been registered? What is the spam score overall on the domain as well as the email? It just does a whole lot of stuff. Well, how can you get around a really great tight filter like that? That's a very good question. How can you? And the bottom line answer is, uh, how about using a QR code? So that's what bad guys are doing right now. They are using a QR code inside emails. Yeah, so the emails that have been caught so far by a company called Abnormal Security have been saying that uh, you have a missed voicemail, and if you want to pick it up, then scan this QR code. It looks pretty legitimate. Obviously designed to bypass enterprise email gateway scans that are really set up to detect malicious links and attachments, right? So all of these QR codes that Abnormal detected were created the same day they were sent. So it's unlikely that the QR codes, even that they'd been detected, would have been previously reported, included in any security blacklist. One of the good things for these bad guys about the QR codes is they can easily change the look of the QR code. So even if the mail gateway software is scanning for pictures 
and looking for specific QR codes, basically, they're still getting around it. So the good news is the use of the QR codes in these types of phishing emails is still quite rare. We're not seeing a lot of them yet. We are just starting to see them. Uh, hyperlinks to phishing sites are really common with some of these QR codes. But this is the first time we've seen an actor embed a functional QR code into an email. Isn't that something? Now, the Better Business Bureau warned of a recent uptick ticking complaints from consumers about scams involving QR codes, not just an email here. But because these codes can't really be read by the human eye at all, the attackers are using them to disguise malicious links. So, you know, that vendor that I talked about, that retail establishment that's using the QR codes and hoping people walking by will scan it in order to get some of that information. Well, people are going to be more and more wary of scanning QR codes, right? Doesn't that just make a lot of sense? Which is why, again, one of the items in our protection stack that we use filters URLs. Now, you can get a free URL filter, and I cover this in my workshop, How to Do It. But if you go to OpenDNS, check them out, OpenDNS. They have a free version. If you're a business, they want you to pay. But we have some business-related ones that let you have your own uh, sites that you block based on categories and all that sort of stuff. But the free stuff is pretty generalized. They usually have two types. One for family, which blocks the stuff you might think would be blocked, uh, and others. So that if you scan one of these QR codes and you are using OpenDNS, Umbrella, one of these others, you're going to be much, much safer because it will most of the time be blocked. Because again, the Umbrella is more up to date than OpenDNS is, but they are constantly monitoring these sites and blocking them as they need to. Uh, Mobile Iron, another security company, uh, conducted a survey of more than 4,400 people last year, and they found that 84% have used a QR code. So that's a little better than I thought it would be. 25% of them said that they had run into situations where a QR code did something they did not expect, including taking them to a malicious website. And I don't know, are they like scanning QR codes in the, in the men's room or something in the stall? I don't know. I've never come across a QR code that was malicious that I tried to scan, but maybe I'm a little more cautious. 37% were cocky, saying that they could spot a malicious QR code. Yeah, yeah, they can read these things. While 70% said they'd be able to spot a URL to a phishing or other malicious website. That I can believe, but part of the problem is when you scan a QR code, it usually comes up and it says, hey, do you want to open this link? And most of that link is invisible, is, is not visible because it is on your smartphone and it's not a very big screen. So it'll just show you the very first part of it. And the first part of it's going to look pretty darn legit. So again, that's why you need to make sure you're using OpenDNS or Umbrella. Ideally, you've got it installed right at your edge, at your router, at whoever's handling DHCP for your organization. Uh, in the phishing campaign, Abnormal had detected with using these QR co uh, codes, they're saying the attackers had previously compromised some Outlook email accounts belonging to some legitimate organizations to send the emails with malicious QR codes. And we've talked about that before. They use password stuffing, et cetera. And we're covering all of this stuff in the boot camp and also... Well, some of it in the boot camp and all of this really in the workshops that are coming up. So keep an eye out for that stuff, okay? Soup to nuts here. Uh, it's, a, it's a real problem. Every week I send out an email and I have been including my show notes in those emails, but I found that most people don't do anything with the show notes. So I'm changing, I'm changing things this week. Now, some of you have gotten the show notes. Some of you haven't gotten the show notes. 
But what I'm going to be doing is I've got my show notes on my website at craigpeterson.com. So you'll find them right there. And you can get the links for everything I talk about right here on the show. I also now have training in every one of my weekly emails. It's usually a little list that we started calling listicles. And it is training on things you can do. It is stuff anybody can do. This is not high-level stuff for people that are in the cybersecurity business, right? Home users, small businesses. But you got to get the email first, craigpeterson.com, and sign up. California is really in trouble with these new environmental laws. And yet, somehow, they found a major exception. They're letting them mine lithium in the Great Salton Sea out in California. We'll tell you why. There's an article in the New York Times, and this is fantastic. It's just uh, incredible. In talking about the lithium gold rush, you already know, I'm sure, that China has been playing games with some of these minerals, some of the ones that we really, really need, exotic minerals that are used to make batteries that are used to power our cars and now california is banning all small gasoline engine sales so the what is it fifty five thousand companies out in california that do lawn maintenance are going to have to drive those big lawn mowers around running on batteries they're estimating it'll take 30 packs battery packs a day now remember california is one of these places that is having rolling blackouts because they don't have enough power right it's not just china it's not just europe where they are literally freezing people they did it last winter they expect to do it more this winter since we stopped shipping natural gas and oil they're freezing people middle of winter turning off the electricity <laughs> California, at least, they're not too likely to freeze unless they're up in the mountains in California. So they don't have enough power to begin with. And what are they doing? They're, they're making it mandatory. I think it was by 2035 that every car sold has to be electric. And now they have just gotten rid of all of the small gasoline engines. They've already got rolling blackouts. Come on, people. Smarten up. So they said, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We need lithium in order to make these batteries, right? You, you've heard of lithium-ion batteries. They're in everything. Now, have you noticed with lithium batteries, you're supposed to take them to a recycling center? And I'm, I'm sure all of you do, right? When your battery is dead in your phone, you take it to a recycling center. Or if you have a battery that you've been using in your Energizer Bunny and it's a lithium battery, of course you take it to the appropriate authorities to be properly disposed of because it's toxic people it is toxic so we have to be careful with this stuff well now we're trying to produce lithium in the united states there are different projects in different parts of the country all the way from maine through of course california in order to try and pull the lithium out of the ground. And let me tell you, this is not very green at all. So Nevada, up in northern Nevada, they've started here blasting and digging out a giant pit in this dormant volcano that's going to serve as the first large-scale lithium mine in the United States in more than a decade. Well, that's good, because we need it. And you know about the supply chain problems, right? You probably heard about that sort of thing. But that's good. This mine is on leased federal lands. What does that mean? Well, that means if Bernie Sanders becomes president with the flick of a pen, just like Joe Biden did on his first day, he could close those leased federal lands. Yeah, and uh, we're back in trouble again because we have a heavy reliance on foreign sources of lithium right now. So this project's known as Lithium Americas. There are some Native American tribes, 
the First Nation, as they're called in Canada, uh, ranchers, environmental groups that are really worried because guess what? In order to mine the lithium and to do the basic processing on site that needs to be done, they will be using billions of gallons of groundwater. Now think of Nevada, think of California. Uh, you don't normally think of massive lakes of fresh water, do you? No. Uh, how about those people that are opposed to fracking? Most of them are opposed to fracking because we're pumping the water and some various chemicals into the ground in order to crack the rock to get the gas out, right? That's what we're doing. They don't like that. But yet somehow contaminating the water for three hundred years and leaving behind a giant mound of waste isn't a problem for these so-called greenies yeah uh, blowing up this is a quote here from max wilbert this is a guy who's been living in a tent on this proposed mine site he's got a couple of lawsuits that are going trying to block the project he says blowing up a mountain isn't green no matter how much marketing spin people put on it now, what have I been saying forever? We're, we're crazy. We are insane. I love electric cars. They are cool as heck. I would drive one if I had one. No problem. I'm not about to go out and buy one. But uh, yeah, it, it's very cool. But it is anything but green. Electric cars and renewable energy are not green. Renewable energy, the solar and the wind, do not stop the need for nuclear plants or oil or gas burners or coal burners, etc. Because when the sun isn't shining, we still need electricity. Where are we going to get it from? When the wind isn't blowing or when the windmills are broken, which happens quite frequently, where are we going to get our power? We have to get it from the same way we always have from maybe some uh, some hydro dams. Right. But really, we got to start paying a lot of it more attention to nuclear. I saw a couple more nuclear licenses were issued for these six gen nuclear plants that are green people. They are green. But back to our lithium mines. They're producing cobalt and nickel as well uh, as the lithium. And they are ruinous to land, water, wildlife and people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have had wars over gold and oil before, and now we're looking at minerals. In fact, there's a race underway between the United States, China, Europe, Russia, and others looking for economic and technological dominance for decades to come by grabbing many of these precious minerals. So let's get into this a little bit further here, okay? So they're trying to do good, but really they're not green. They're, they're not doing good. And this is causing friction, okay? Um, first three months of this year, U.S. lithium miners raised nearly $3.5 billion from Wall Street, seven times the amount raised in the last six months, or 36 months. Yeah, huge. Money's going into it, okay? Uh, they're going after lithium from California's largest lake, the Salton Sea. Yeah, yeah. So they're going to use specially coated beads to extract lithium salt from the hot liquid pumped up from an aquifer more than 4,000 feet below the surface. Hmm, sounds like drilling. Aren't they anti-drilling too? The self-contained systems connected to geothermal power plants generating emission-free electricity. Oh, that's right. They don't have a problem with the ring of fire in California with earthquakes and things, right? So, yeah, they, uh, yeah drilling on that and using the, the uh, geothermal, it's not going to be a problem. Uh, so, um, yeah, so they are hoping to generate revenue needed to restore the lake fouled by toxic runoff from area farms for decades. So they're looking to do more here. Lithium brine in Arkansas, Nevada, North Dakota, as I mentioned already, Maine. 
Uh, they're using it in every car that's out there, smartphones, etc. Uh, the U.S. has some of the world's largest reserves, which is, I guess, a very good thing, right? Uh, Silver Peak Mine in Nevada is producing 5,000 tons a year, which is less than 2% of the world's supply. Uh, this is just absolutely amazing going through this, okay? Um an Obama administration official, Ben Steinberg, said right now if China decided to cut off the U.S. for a variety of reasons, we're in trouble. Yeah, you think? Uh, another thing here in the New York Times article is from this rancher, and it's a bit of a problem. He's got 500 cows and calves roaming his 50,000 acres in Nevada's high desert. He's going to have to start buying feed for them. This local mine is going to reach about 370 feet. Uh, here's another kind of interesting thing. This mine, one mine is going to consume 3,200 gallons of water per minute. Yeah, in, in barren Nevada. I, I'm looking at a picture of this, and it is just dead sagebrush. Oh, my gosh. So they're expecting the water table will drop at least 12 feet. They're going to be producing 66,000 tons of battery-grade lithium carbonate a year. But uh, here we go. They're digging out this uh, mountainside, and they're using 5,800 tons of sulfuric acid per day. Yeah, they're mixing clay dug out from the, mo from the mountainside with 5,800 tons of clay, uh, of sulfuric acid, I should say, every day. They're also consuming 354 million cubic yards of mining waste. I'm not consuming, creating 354 million cubic yards of mining waste loaded with uh, discharge from this sulfuric acid treatment and may contain modest amounts of radioactive uranium. That's according to the permit documents are expecting it'll degrade quote unquote 5,000 acres of winter range used by the antelope hurt the habitat of the sage grouse nesting areas for eagles it just goes on and on it is nuts BLM is nuts uh, of course we're talking about the Bureau of Land Management but I guess both BLMs are nuts and this is a real problem and the tribes are trying to stop it the farmers are trying to stop it but hey california needs more lithium batteries for their electric cars their electric lawn mowers leaf blowers etc so we got to get that lithium we got to get it right away uh, in order for their green appetite insane hey get some sanity CraigPeterson.com. Sign up for my newsletter right now. Doing a little training here on how to spot fake login pages. We just covered phishing and some real world examples of it. Uh, some free quiz stuff that you can use to help with it. And now we're moving on to the next step. The next thing to look for when it comes to the emails and these fake login pages is a spelling mistake or grammatical errors. Most of the time, these emails that we get that are fake emails are, have really poor grammar in them. Many times, of course, the, the commas are in the wrong place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But most of us weren't English majors, so we're not going to pick that up, myself included, right? That's why I use Grammarly. If, if you have to ever write anything, or which includes anything from an email or a document, uh, you, you probably want to get Grammarly. There's a few out there, but that's the one I like the best for making sure my grammar's right. So a tip, I guess, to the hackers out there. But the hackers will often use a URL that is very close to where you want to go. So they might put a zero in place of an O in the domain, or they might make up some other domain. So it might be uh, Amazon-AWS.com or uh, TD bank dash uh, account.com something like that sometimes the registrars will catch that sort of thing and kill it sometimes the business that they are trying to fake 
will catch it and let them know as well. There's companies out there that watch for that sort of thing. But many times it takes a while and it's only fixed once enough people have reported it. So look at the URL, make sure it's legitimate. I always advise that instead of clicking on the link in the email, try and go directly to the website. It's like the old days. You got a phone call and somebody saying, yeah, I'm from the bank and I need your name and social security number so I can validate that someone broke into your account. No, 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 no. They don't They don't just call you up like that. Nowadays, they'll send you a message in their app that's on your smartphone, but they're not going to call you. And the advice I've always given is look up their phone number. And by the way, do it in the phone book. <laughs> Remember those? And then call them back. That's the safest way to do that sort of thing. And that's true for emails as well. If it's supposedly your bank and it's reporting something like someone has broken into your account, which is a pretty common technique for these fishers, these hackers that are out there, just type in the bank URL as you know it, not what's in the email, and there will be a message message there for you if it's legitimate always okay so before you click on any website email links just try and go directly to the website now if it's one of these deep links where it's taking you to something specific within the site the next trick you can play is to just mouse over the link. So bring your mouse down to where the link is. And typically what will happen is at the bottom left of your your screen or of the window, it'll give you the actual link. Now, if you look at some of them, for instance, the emails that I send out, I don't like to bother people. So if you haven't opened one of my emails in a while, I'll just automatically say, hey, I haven't opened them in a while, and then I will drop you off the list. Plus, if you hit reply to one of my uh, newsletters, my show notes newsletters, that's just fine, but it's not going to go to me at craigpeterson.com. And some people... You listeners, being the best and brightest, have noticed that. What happens is it comes up and it's some really weird URL. That's so I can track who responded to me. And that way I can just sit down and say, okay, now let me go through who has responded. And I've got a kind of a customer relationship management system that lets me keep track of all of that stuff so that I know that you responded. I know you're interacting. So I know I'm not bothering you. Right. And I know I need to respond to you. Well, much the same thing is true with some of these links. When I have a link in my newsletter and I say, hey, I'm linking to MIT's article, it, it uh, is not going to be an MIT link. Because, again, I, I want to know, what are you guys interested in? So anytime you click on a link, I'll know. And I need to know that so I know, well, hey, wait a minute now, 50% of all of the people that open the emails are interested in identifying fake login pages. So what do I do? I do something like I'm doing right now. I go into depth on fake login pages. I wouldn't have known that if I wasn't able to track it. So just because the link doesn't absolutely look legit doesn't mean it isn't legit. But then again, if it's a bank, if it involves financial transactions or some of these other things, be more cautious. So double check for misspellings or grammatical errors. Next thing to do is to check the certificate, the security certificate on the site you're on. This gets a little bit confusing. If you go to a website, you might notice up on the URL bar, the bar that has the universal resource locator that's part of the internet, you might have noticed there's a lock. And people might have told you to check for the lock. Well, that lock does not mean that you are safe. All it means is there is a secure VPN from your computer 
to the computer on the other side. So if it's a hacker on the other side, you're sending your data securely to the hacker, right? That's not really going to do you a whole lot of good. This is probably one of the least understood things in the whole computer security side. The connection may be secure, but is this really who you think it is? So what you need to do is click on the certificate and the certificate will tell you more detail. So double check the certificate and make sure it is for the site you really wanted to go to. So when it's a bank site, it's going to say, you know, the bank is going to have the bank information on it. That makes sense. But if you go, for instance, and I'm going to throw a monkey wrench into this whole thing. If you go to craigpeterson.com, for instance, it's going to say connection is secure. The certificate is valid. But if you look at the certificate and the trust in the details, it's going to be issued by some company but it's going to just say craigpeterson.com. It's not going to give a business name like it would probably do for a bank. So, you know, a little bit of a twist to it, but that's an important thing. Don't just count on the lock. Make sure that the certificate is for the place you want to contact, okay? Last but not least is multi-factor authentication. I can't say this enough. If the bad guys have your username or email address and your password for a site, if you're using multi-factor authentication, they cannot get in. So it's going to prevent credential stuffing tactics where they'll use your email and password combinations that have already been stolen from other sites to try and hack in to your online profiles. So very important to set up and I advise against using two-factor authentication with your just a cell phone as in a text message sms it is not secure and it's being hacked all of the time get an authorization app like one password for instance and you should be using one password anyways for all of your passwords and then google has a free one called google authenticator use those instead of your phone number for authentication i've been warning about biometric databases and i i sat down with a friend of mine who is an attorney and he's using this clear thing at the airport i don't know if you've seen it but uh, it's a biometric database what are the real world risks here well this company uses biometrics it's using your eye print if you will it's using your iris every one of us has a pretty darn unique iris and they're counting on that and they're using it to let you through tsa very quickly and this attorney friend of mine thinks it's the best thing since sliced bread because he can just walk right on through But the problem here is that we're talking about biometrics. If your password gets stolen, you can change it. If your email account gets hacked, I have another friend who his account got hacked. You can get a new email account. If your iris scan that's in this biometric database gets stolen, you cannot replace Your eyes, unless, of course, you're Tom Cruise. (laughs) You remember that movie, right? And it's impossible to replace your fingerprints. It's impossible to replace your face print. Well, I guess you could to a degree or another, right? Some fat injections or other things could be done to change your face print. But these iris scans, fingerprints, and facial images are something I try not to provide anybody. Apple has done a very good job with the security of their face print as well as their fingerprint because they do not send any of that information up directly to themselves or to any database at all, period. 
they are stored only on the device itself and they're in this wonderful little piece of electronics that cannot be physically compromised and to date has not been electronically compromised either they've done a very very good job other vendors on other operating systems like android uh, again not so much but there are also databases that are being kept out there by the federal government. I mentioned this clear database, which isn't the federal government. It's a, a private company, but the federal government obviously has its fingers into that thing. The Office of Personnel uh, for the federal government they had their entire database, at least pretty much the entire database, I think it was 50 million people, stolen by the Red Chinese about six years ago. So the communists got uh, copies of all of the information that the Office of Personnel Management had about people, including background checks and things. You've probably heard me talk about that before. So having that information in a database is dangerous because it attracts the hackers. It attracts the cyber criminals. They want to get their hands on it. They'll do all kinds of things to try and get their hands on it. We now have completely quit Afghanistan. We left in a hurry. We did some incredibly stupid things. I just, I can't believe I, a president of the United States would do what was done here. And now it's been coming out that President Biden completely ignored the advice that he was getting from various military intelligence and, and other agencies out there and just said, no, we're going to be out of there. You have to limit your troops to this. And that's what caused them to close the air base Bagram that we had had for so many years. Apparently, the Chinese are talking about taking it over now. Yeah, isn't that nice? And whereas this wasn't an eternal war, right? We hadn't had anybody die in a year and a half. Uh, it, 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 it's crazy. We have troops in South Vietnam. We have troops in Germany. We have troops in countries all over the world. Japan, you name it. So that we have a f local force that can keep things calm. And we were keeping things calm. It's just mind-blowing. But anyhow, politics aside... <laughs> We left behind a massive database, a biometric database of Afghanis that had been helping us over in Afghanistan, as well as a database that was built using U.S. contractors of everyone in the Afghan military and basically their genealogy who their parents were, their grandparents, the blood type, weight, height. I'm looking at it right now, all of the records in here. The sex, ID, nationality, uh, date of exploration, hair color, favorite fruit, favorite vegetables, place of birth, uncle's name, marker signature, approval signature, date, place of birth, date of birth, address, permanent address, national ID number, place of ISS, date of ISS, native language, salary, date of salary, group of salary, place of salary, education, father's name, graduation date, kind of weapon, and service number. These were all in place in Afghanistan. We put them in place because we were worried about ghost soldiers. A ghost soldier was someone who we were paying the salary of. Taxpayers of the United States were paying the salaries of the Afghan military for quite some time. And we were thinking that about half of these payroll checks that we were funding were actually not going to people who were in the military, but were going to people who were high up within the Afghan government and military. So we put this in place to get rid of the ghost soldiers. Everybody had to have all of this stuff in the database. 36 pieces of information just for police recruitment. 
Now, this information we left behind. And apparently, this database is completely in the hand of the Taliban. Absolutely. So we're talking about Americans who helped construct Afghanistan and the military and the Taliban. The looking for the networks of their opponent's supporters. This is just absolutely amazing. So all of the data doesn't have clear use. Like who cares about the favorite fruit or vegetable? But the rest of it does. The genealogy does. You, they now know who was in the police department, who was in the military, who their family is, what their permanent address is. Okay? Did you see the problem here? And the biometrics as well. And the biometrics are part of this U.S. system that we were using called HIDE, H-I-I-D-E. And this whole HIDE thing was a biometric reader that the military could keep with them. There were tens of thousands of these things out in the field. And when they had an encounter with someone, they would look up their biometrics, see if they were already in the database. And in the database, it would say, yeah, you know, they're friendly, they're an informant, or uh, we found them in this area, or, you know, we're watching them, we have concern about them, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of their actions were in there. Well... Turns out that this database, which covered about 80% of all Afghans, and these devices are now in the hands of the Taliban. Now, the good news with this is that a lot of this information cannot be easily extracted. So you're not going to get some regular run-of-the-mill Taliban guy to pick one of these up and start using it. But uh, what's happening here is that we can really predict that one of these surrounding companies like Pakistan that has been very cooperative with the Taliban, in fact, they gave refuge to Saddam, not Saddam Hussein, but to uh, bin Laden and also Iran and China and Russia. Any of those countries should be able to get into that database. Okay, so uh, I think that's really important to remember. Now, a Defense Department spokesperson, quote here, Eric Fayon, says the U.S. has taken prudent actions to ensure that sensitive data does not fall into the Taliban's hands. This data is not at risk of misuse. Misuse, that's unfortunately about all I can say. But Thomas Johnson, a research professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, says uh, not so fast. The Taliban may have used biometric information in the Kunduz attack. So instead of taking the data straight from the Hyde devices, he told MIT Technology Review that it is possible that Taliban sympathizers in Kabul provided them with databases of military personnel against which they could verify prints. In other words, even back in 2016, it may have been the databases rather than these high devices themselves that pose the greatest risk. This is very concerning. Big article here in MIT Technology Review. I'm quoting from it a little bit here. But there are a number of databases. They are biometric, many of these. They have genealogical information. They have information that can be used to round up and track down people. Now, I'm not going to mention World War II, and I'm not going to mention what happened with the government before Hitler took over, because to do that means you lose. That government had registered firearms. That government had registered the civilians and the people. And in Afghanistan, the government was also, as part of our identification papers, registering your religion. If you're Christian, they're hunting you down. If you were working for the military, they're hunting you down. And this is scary. That's part of the reason I do not want biometric information and databases to be kept here in the U.S. 
Hey, make sure you get my show notes every week on time along with free training. I'm trying to help you guys out. CraigPeterson.com. CraigPeterson.com. Here I am, cybersecurity strategist and available to you.